Just what we needed, another move from the UN. Their Human Rights Commission is now looking into possible war crimes in Gaza. And you're never going to believe it, a Canadian's at the helm. He's now disputing claims that he's anti Israel. Joining me now, Noah Schack for the, from the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. Thanks so much for being here, Noah. Thanks for having me. All right, so I, I, right off the top, I want to get to a tweet from our Foreign Minister, John Baird, uh, upon learning the information. It says, UN Human Rights Council continues to be a sham for advancing human rights. Today's announcement for members of its Gaza inquiry reveals its agenda. All right, Noah, starting off the top, talk to me about big picture. What, is, what does our Foreign Minister mean by the agenda? Here. What is the agenda as far as you perceive it? Well, the, the UN Human Rights Council has been routinely abused by the, its members who constitute some of the world's worst human rights abusers. And, and they, they use uh, this mechanism that is supposed to act as a shield for the world's most vulnerable people uh, instead to shield themselves. And they, they often use Israel, most often use Israel, as a convenient scapegoat. Now, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about this man, a law professor by the name of William. Shabis. He is at the helm of this commission. Uh, John Baird, Canadian, speaking out against a commission headed by a uh, Canadian. There's got to be some sort of conflict here. Flesh out. What, what, what's Professor Shabis like? What do we know about him? Well, the, the real issue here with, with Mr. Shabis is pr our previous remarks that he's made accusing Israel of war crimes, stating his uh, desire to prosecute Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for war crimes at the International Criminal Court. And whenever you are having a fact-finding mission, uh, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to have someone running that mission who already has these opinions and, and has already decided uh, what should be happening as a result. So it, it sort of prejudges the outcome of, of this, of this fact-finding mission in the first place. Uh, the reality is, even before Mr. Shabas was placed at the helm, the, the, the outcome was already prejudged. The European countries uh, stated that uh, the European Union stated that it was completely prejudicial that that by using legal terminology in the mandate at the outset this whole thing was a sham uh, and and uh, the constituted officers of this the the panelists uh, just just take it one step further so you say it's going to be basically a predetermined outcome what is that outcome and how is it going to play out? And here I want us to focus a bit on, on, on the media because I know that there is a tendency of using this, this, this in a lot of cases, garbage that's put out by the UN, frankly. Uh, and the, the, the media just kind of rolls with it and says, and here's why Israel is guilty of X, Y, Z. What can we expect after this prejudged outcome, as you call it? Well, the reality is that uh, the scope of this mandate is, is more or less exclusively focused on Israel. So they won't be examining in depth uh, Hamas's crimes against Israel, firing rockets into civilian population centers. The mandate is exclusively uh, tied to Gaza. And, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the resolution that called for this panel, Hamas wasn't mentioned a single time. And so it's hard to imagine anything uh, other than a one-sided outcome uh, uh, as a result of this process. In terms of the media, there, have been, uh, there has been talk about uh, one of the invited panelists uh, uh, coming on board, George Clooney's wife, uh, for the very reason of attracting m more media attention to, to the, the investigation. Uh, I don't know whether or not that was the case, uh, but in any event, she's declined to be part of the panel, which again speaks to how professional and, and uh, credible this, this panel is, where they announce that it's taking place before they've confirmed with the invited panelists that they'll actually be taking part. And when the UN's not even paying attention to possible war crimes or at least egregious offenses by Hamas, we know that they use human shields uh, for their rockets. Uh, Netanyahu famously saying, you know, we use our rockets to defend our people, but Hamas uses her people to defend her rockets. Uh, it, it's no wonder that so much of society uh, doesn't focus on, on, on those offenses by Hamas. Now, I, I want you to uh, walk me through where we are right now, because our viewers at home might be getting a little bit caught up in, okay, what's the latest from Gaza? We've had so many ceasefires. Ceasefires have been broken. We're in day two of the most recent ceasefire. Um, what, what, what's the story? Where are we at there? Everything all, all smooth sailing so far? Well, the, the problem with the ceasefire uh, negotiations actually does tie back in with, with the UN. Uh, these types of moves uh, uh, really do a, go a long way to bolster extremists and marginalize moderates. 
and that's not good when you're trying to resolve a, a hot conflict to, to reach a ceasefire agreement and to move towards peace. It only exacerbates the problems. And it's not only the UN's uh, acts of commission that do this, it's their acts of omission. It's the United States that's dropping aid packages for the Yazidi people who are fleeing uh, Islamist extremists in Iraq. It's, it's not the UN. Uh, where is the UN Commission of Inquiry into what's transpiring as a result of ISIS or Boko Haram or any of these other groups that are similar in Hamas in their, ideolo in their ideology and in their agenda? So I think as we look at this, these negotiations, which there are conflicting reports whether or not they're, they're moving forward uh, or whether or not we'll need an extension of this current ceasefire, uh, we really need to keep uh, in mind all of these different things that are happening around and, and the credibility and the, and the boost that they end up giving to Hamas, which makes negotiations uh, far more difficult for moderates, for the Egyptians, for the Israelis, and even for the Palestinian Authority, who, who all just want to end the fighting. Unbelievable. The, the UN would rather focus its attention to Israel as opposed to ISIS, uh, much more well-known, documented uh, 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 heinous crimes, I would say, against humanity there, the beheading of children. I don't think anyone would shy away from saying so. Okay, um, this ceasefire um, holding right now, they're in truce talks in Egypt. Is Can we expect anything good to come of there? Do, do you think there going to be any big stumbling blocks that they really have to get over? Well, I hope we, can, we have a good outcome. The mm -hmm. major stumbling block is Hamas rejection. They chose this war. They've continually chosen to reject ceasefires uh, and, unless their maximalist demands are met. In contrast, Israel has negotiated in good faith uh, and has steadily reduced what it's demanding. They're no long, the government is no longer calling for the full demilitarization of Gaza. They're just calling for the prevention of Hamas rearming. And so while Israel has shown a willingness to compromise and scale back uh, its demands, Hamas has dug in its heels uh, up until now, uh, rejecting anything other than their maximal demands, which of course includes the building of a seaport to facilitate the importing of arms, which is, is just something that, that Israel and Egypt and even the Palestinian Authority uh, I don't think can accept at this juncture. Now, Hamas obviously labeled a terrorist organization in this country. Um, Okay, so Israel doesn't have any friends at the UN. Uh, what's the perception of the Canadian uh, government's position on Israel by Israelis? Well, Israel does have friends at the UN, and Canada is, <laughs> is among them. There's just very few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, Canada, over the, over the last uh, decade or so, has really uh, been recognized by Israel. We weren't really on the map before uh, to, to, to this extent. And, and it's not only the Israelis who recognize and appreciate the friendship, but even uh, a senior advisor to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas uh, made a comment to the Globe and Mail when Minister Baird was in the region that uh, Canada's enhanced friendship with Israel is actually good for peace, good for the peace process, and that it's appreciated uh, in terms of moving things forward. So I think all across the board, Canada's uh, greater engagement in what's going on over there uh, and, and uh, the, the, uh, the understanding that Canada has accorded to its fellow liberal democratic ally has, has gone a long way. And can you contrast it at all with the U.S., up or down in favor when it comes to your average Israeli on the ground? I think, uh, again, I, I can only speak for my own perception, but mm -hmm. I think that the average Israeli is, is, is not dissimilar from uh, average people everywhere else. You mm -hmm. know, what, whatever you may want from the American administration, I think everybody can agree that uh, calling out red lines and then retreating from them uh, is bad for business. Uh, it's bad. It's bad for foreign policy, and it it uh, wh whatever the re rationale or whatever the the level of engagement that the administration wants to put forward, uh, drawing those red lines and then retreating from them uh, sets a bad precedent. It, it, it makes it so that way your allies don't trust in you and your enemies no longer fear you. Uh, now, very finally, I met up with some protesters, which we're going to get to some viz in a bit with our next guest. But I met up with some protesters yesterday who seem to think that uh, there is a a peaceful resolution to. Gaza right now. Ask me, uh, so long as Hamas is at the helm, you can't negotiate with terrorists and it's going to be a bumpy road no matter what is, is accomplished in Egypt today or tomorrow. Um, do you agree with that statement? Do we need to get rid of Hamas to see some sort of a brighter hope on the horizon for Gaza? Well, I, I, I hope that that's not necessary. I hope that uh, Hamas has been sufficiently weakened, that they, their weapons stockpile has been sufficiently diminished and their attack tunnels sufficiently destroyed by the Israeli operation, that uh, they're in a position now where they cannot mount an effective campaign against Israel. 
I, I hope that that's the case and that, that we can have a, a, ch a serious change and a significant change that won't see us back here uh, in the f coming weeks, months or years. Uh, of course, the Israeli government has, has made it very clear that if Hamas won't uh, reach a solution diplomatically, Israel will have to achieve its objectives militarily, as they did during Operation Protective Edge. And uh, I'm sure that all Israelis, uh, as most Canadians as well, uh, would not want to see that go forward right now. Uh, it's not like they're itching to go back into Gaza. But if Hamas doesn't leave them a diplomatic avenue to reach uh, quiet and peace, uh, they may not have another option. Well, it sounds like our hopes and prayers are the exact same, Noah. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks with for us having today. me. All right.